Thank you very much, Reverend uh, Meredith, for the invitation. And um, always nice to be to be talking in Miami. So it's good. You know. Okay. So the goal of this talk is to explain some aspects of the superconformal field theories of class S and <coughs> how a mathematical translation ends up involving families of Hitchin systems over moduli spaces and the study of the singularities <coughs> of the spectral covers. And this is joint work with Ashwin Stubramanian at Rutgers and John Bissler in Texas. So four-dimensional superconformal field theories have been a subject of study for many years. Recently, a class of such theories that admitted geometric construction from six dimensions have received attention. This includes several familiar theories with autobiotic Lagrangians and more mysterious theories for which there is no known Lagrangian description. In the realization from six dimensions, the Hitchin system plays an important role. Specifically, the Coulomb parameter associated to the four-dimensional theory can be described as the base of Hitchin system, associated to some simply lazily algebra J and the divided curve C yeah. So you have a curve C with G is G and marked points, and you put some algebra on it. Don't ask me why it's called J and a G physics convention. The choice of the Lie algebra parameterizes the possible six-dimensional theories and the choice of the curve determines the complexification. And the effect of putting the, the punctures in just makes the Higgs fields be allowed to, to be neomorphic. I'll review that in, in, in a moment. So um, a possible reason that this is in this conference is because of something called 3D mirror symmetry. So three-dimensional n equals four theories have a modulized space consisting of two branches, Higgs branch and Coulomb branch. <coughs> and 3D mirror symmetry is supposed to exchange them roughly. So Nakajima in 2015 wrote a paper where he initiates a mathematical theory of these things and that was greatly elaborated by Graham and Finkelberg and Nakajima, <coughs> a series of follow-up papers. Um, I can say a little bit more about 3D mirror symmetry, but the truth is I don't have anything to say about it. So um, let me just leave that as a black box and move on. So here's what the physics tells us. We have we we'll consider what they call pain defects, which basically means that the divisor we mark on the Riemann surface has, that consists of distinct points, where the Higgs field in the Higgs system has a simple point and the punctures. <coughs> in order to obtain superconformal field theories using pain defects, you need the residue to be a nil put in rather than the algebra. And at some point, they start looking at mass <coughs> deformations. The eigenvalues become the masses. So the, the massless case is the one that they're looking at. What really matters is just the J conjugacy class to which the element A belong, or residue. So it's helpful to label the Hitchin boundary condition by the nil potent orbit, O sub A, or O sub H. Does this work? Yeah. O sub A, or O sub H. Uh, there are additional complications for groups other than SLN, uh, which I'll describe in a second. But basically, you need to specify some additional discrete data. So uh, in a word, it's known that if you take the centralizer of an input and orbit, or of an element of an input and orbit, it has a, the, the centralizer has a finite group of components that might not be trivial. In type A, and it's always trivial in other types. It's not, and then you need to <coughs> introduce additional discrete data to take care of, to account for those possible extra components. 
So this is one of several reasons that in the current work we focus just on SLA. Okay. So a, a crucial feature of this geometric organization from six dimensions is that you see what the modular space is. The modular space of the theories is the modular space of the Riemann surfaces. And if you look more carefully, it's the compactification, the delimited compactification of the modular space of punctured Riemann surfaces. When you restrict to a quarter dimension one boundary condition, boundary structure of the gene bar, the physicists see a weakly coupled gauge group with an associated gauge coupling related to the, 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 the plumbing fixture. So, um, and that, uh, basically the distance from, from the boundary, or the, the width of uh, the generating mirror surface. When we start to quite mention K boundary stratum, you get K simple factors in the gauge group that don't become weak. So I guess you can go all the way to the zero dimensional isolated boundary strata. So those involve 3G minus 3 plus N simple factors, which correspond to the nodes of, of uh, uh, pans the composition of the curve. And you have 2G minus 2 plus N isolated superconformal field theories that you're dividing. So you're roughly taking the product of 2G minus 2 plus N of these isolated field theories, theories that have no moduli, because we've gone to zero dimensions, and you divide by a group of the product of that many simple factors. <coughs> and the best circumstances, the group that you divide by is just J itself, or rather the, um, usually the adjoint group corresponding to the adjoint J. However, there are cases where what you get is a proper subgroup H of J. So this often corresponds to uh, somewhat surprising physical phenomenon that you can have a superconformal field theory with group J, which is S dual to a superconformal field theory with a smaller gauge group, but coupled to non-Lagrangian matter. So this is where the non-Lagrangian stuff comes in. The first such example was due to a Jewish and Cyborg. And this was later given a class S interpretation in a deep series of works by Gayoto. And my collaborator, Jacques Dissler, also wrote this, a series of papers. The key word there is tinker toys. He has a way of building these theories from elementary building bricks that they call the tinker toys. They roughly correspond to this pair, pairs of pan. Yeah. It's, it's true that this MJ bar really was the space that has a logarithmic structure that you get. So deformation theory, it's not really what you see. Uh, you, you see that in, in general, my feeling is if you go to these boundary points, you get uh, something like analog of mixed cost structures. So, uh, you know, I'm going to talk about this uh, in a minute. No, no, it, it may be as I said, the parameterized conform field theory, but it's not really a remote space. I'm not sure. The, okay, the, the, yeah. This is the received wisdom from the physicists. I, yeah, I can yeah. only quote them. Um, the, 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 the theory you get, or a, a big chunk of it, turns out to be independent of the point yeah. where you are. So, so in, in that sense, it, it lives on, the, on a whole punctual neighborhood of the boundary, and therefore it's reasonable to expect it to, to actually extend across the boundary. But that's what they tell me. We show that the appearance of these smaller groups as the weakly coupled gauge groups can be understood using the Hitchin system on nodal curves. So that's going to be the main mathematical content of the talk. With this, one has a clear, <coughs> clear, clearer geometric picture of how the smaller gauge groups arise. Classification of, interse of interesting nodes and physically interesting Hitchin systems for fixed J amounts to classification of the possibly the possible weakly coupled gauge groups that can appear. And we do this subject to some physics reasonability constraints. And conversely, the Tinker Toy classification gives you 
a bunch of examples and then we can what, realize them using the agent systems. So one concept that keeps ap appearing in this story is a trichotomy that we can do to Gayoto and Witten and then in a slightly more relevant setup by Gayoto and Razamat, I believe it was. Uh, anyway, they take the theories and they call some of them bad, some of them ugly, and the remaining ones are good. And then you can press some with you in the back. <laughs> so, um, I see I, I didn't write this up. Um, they describe it in terms of the Higgs branch of the theories. So they, does, they classify the, the, the theories into good, bad, and ugly, depending on properties of the Higgs branch moduli. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to translate it into properties of the Coulomb branch, which is basically the base of the Higgs system. <coughs> so in case you are not familiar with the Higgs system, it's a global version of the quotient map from the algebra to its Cartan or to the Viper. So in the case of SLN, which is the map that sends a matrix to its spectrum. So T is a Cartan, the algebra G, the group G, W is a Viper. So as I said, it's just the, the spectrum. Given a curve in the group and the line from the end on the curve. The total space of the hit of uh, the Higgins system is the space of Higgs bundles. So it's the modular space of L value G Higgs bundles on the curve C. For G equals G L N this just means pairs V phi with V is a rank in vector bundle and phi is an L value into morphism of V called the Higgs field. For general G you replace the vector bundle by a principal G bundle and phi by an adjoint section. So again, there are different versions of this. You can have a stack, you can have a space, depending on which, portion, which kind of portion you want to form. The base is a vector space. It's a space of sections of some slightly crazy thing. You take the line bundle, and you tend to it with T, and then you notice that the vial group acts. It acts trivially in the line bundle. It's it just the, the reflection of the presentation on the contact. So this thing is a bundle over the, C, over the curve C, and you take its global section, that's the base. There's a more explicit way of writing it in terms of invariant differentials. So a point on the base determines the W gamma cover, called the camera cover, C tended to C, which is just the inverse image. So you have a map from this thing without the W quotient to the thing with the quotient. If you have a point here, it's a section. Its inverse image here is a multi-section, like it's a W gamma cover. The choice of a representation row of the group G maps the camera cover to what's called the speckle cover, so C tilde depending on row, which sits in the total space of the line of the and parameterizing the spectra of the vector space of the morphism of row of phi on the points of the curve. When row is faithful, the, the data is equivalent, so you can work with spectra or camera without any loss. So explicitly, you can write down the basis global sections of those powers of L, where R, the number of summons, is the, the rank of the Lie algebra or the dimension of the Cartan. And the DIs, the powers of here, are the degrees of the gene band polynomials. So for GLN, those are just 1 through N. For SLN, they're going to be 2 through N. For the orthogonal group, it's 2, 4, 6, 8, and so on, plus instead of and you have half of that for the Fafia and so on. Of course, you may have applied to the Higgs field phi in terms of family parameters by C over L value points of T and W. And this is the H. So the H map H from Higgs to B takes a bundle of the Higgs field and sends it to the, the family of points of T and W. So Hitchin 
consider the, in the case of Edward, it's a canonical bundle. And you prove that Higgs is homomorphic and symplectic, and the map to the base is a Lagrangian map. And in the homomorphic case, you take L to be K with poles on some divisor D. So L is K series poles on D, which is an effective divisor. And I'm, I'm going to take, consider today only the case where D is reduced. So that's a tame case. Markman and Botticin separately prove that the modulus which Higgs in that case is Poisson, and the map is Lagrangian or weakly Lagrangian, whatever you want to call it, meaning that the residue map from Higgs to the space of continuous classes at, at the point of D sends a meromorphic Higgs bundle to the conjugate class of its residue. So the split leaves are just the fibers. So that means you have a map from your total space to some quotient object, to a quotient stack. And the fibers are the symplectic leaves in the Poisson. So the closure of the regular or generic symplectic leaves are parameterized by global sections of the W of the divide of D. In a and so there are fibers of the composition where you take the Hitcher map and form it by the residue at the points of D. The, so these fibers are going to be the closures of the generic fibers. There are other fibers that are of lower dimension, which are kind of hidden and harder to visualize. And we will see some of those coming up in a little while. OK. So um, my physicist friends are mostly interested in the simplest case which is where you take the curve to be P1 with four branch points. So four is the smallest number where you have moduli. Three of them will give you a rigid picture. So uh, you have four punctures, the one through the four, and lambda is a cross ratio, that's the modulus. In fact, you can co construct an explicit global model for the, for the whole family, start with plane, blow it up at four points, for example, the coordinate points, one, zero, 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 one, zero, and so on. And you can realize that zero, four bar is a family of conics through those four points. So you can just take this pencil of conics, pull it back to P2 tilde, blow up. Now you have a vibration. So you have a family, here it is, of conics C lambda. The generic one is just a CP1. There are three values of lambda, namely 0, 1, and infinity, where you get a reducible curve instead of a P1. So at the three, at those, those are the three boundary points where I do a full bar. And it, so at one of them, you get a curve C0, which is given by, let's say, y times minus x equals 0. And then there will be a second one, 1, and then 1 at infinity. So the difference between those is just the distribution of which two of the four points set on which component of the, of the curve. So this story tends to, tend to be rich enough, so we'll just stick with that for now. So let's try to describe the Higgs field phi in terms of this model. So you can pick a global L which restricts to the right L on each of the curves. So um, on each of the curves, you have four points. The canonical bundle would be O of minus 2. You allow poles at four points, you get O of plus 2. So the basic line bundle L is just O of 2. So you, you want a line bundle of the whole thing, which restricts to O of 2 on each of them, and restricts correctly to the singular part. So you can write down this spectral curve by some equation, where the phi k's are global sections of the k that vanish to certain orders. So there's a, a matrix chi that describes the orders of the vanishing. It has four rows, I guess, corresponding to the four marked points. And n minus one is the rank of the algebra. So that's the number of invariant, the number of k's. So if all your nilpotents are regular, which is the generic case, then all the kinds are going to be one, which is the smallest possible value. So making a nilpotent just says that it has to vanish. 
and making it a regularly put set of benches to, to the lowest possible order. Smaller than put in orbit, we're going to, going to consider the higher value of the kites. And I'm going to show you some of the number thing there. I think I'm saying it right here. So when the orbit of the four punctures are sufficiently big, for example, regular, we get a node that's unrestricted. We call such a node the standard node. In various cases, every node is a standard node. So those are not the ones we're going to look at. So a separating node, that means one that cuts the curve into two components. Yeah, so uh, th th those are the nodes that uh, arise in this example. So let's do the case where J is A3 or SL4. So um, consider the puncture sphere where each puncture raises the next field is the regular one. So this is the easiest example. So that's the principal important orbit of the SL4. That's a mistake. That should be, it's not the principal, it's the regular. Um, this corresponds to quite a bit of, like, I have simple zero, so that means that all the chi's were one. So the, so phi k is a section of L to the k, vanishing on the four exceptional devices and nothing else. So this gives you a global section, a global description on the universal curve of what the phi's are. So you can compute with that quite easily. So here's a slightly larger than the need to be picture of the two, com the two components. Two of the mark points move to the left, two of them move to the right. In this case, all of them say four to indicate that it's the regular input. Is that your problem? So the regular nilpotent for SLN are described by partitions of the number n. So let's say for SL4, is this visible? You can have the regular nilpotent. You can have a subregular dot dot dot. You can have the minimal nilpotent, and you can have the zero nilpotent. So the regular nilpotent corresponds to a single Jordan block of size four. The subregular corresponds to a three and a one. The minimal will correspond to a 2 and a 1 and a 1. And the 0 corresponds to 4 1 by 1 blocks. And in fact, I've only skipped one thing, which is 2 squared. One that doesn't have a good name. So you can describe this by a diagram either this way or this way. And similarly, this one would be this or this and so on. So since there are two ways of doing it, and you can't decide which one you want, you give both the names. You call this one the Hitchin diagram and this one the NAM diagram. So it's a, fair, a fairly uh, pointless distinction in the case of SLN. It becomes more important for the other groups where the duality is actually, it's something called Spaltenstein duality and it's actually fairly complicated. It's not one to one. So you have to specify the NAM diagram and the Hitchin diagram. But, but fortunately, we don't have to worry about any of that. So, um, in this particular case, the, st the standard node, where we just have a four in all of them, that means that my picture is something like four, 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 and four, and I have a reducible curve containing them. Then. I'm tabulating some of the information for you here. So here is explicitly the equation this power cover. 
we've labeled all the coefficients. So if it says u to c, that means it's a quadratic differential, a section of L squared that lives in the center. And L means left, and R means right. So what does that mean? If the equation is something like z times x minus y equals 0. So z equals 0 and x minus y equals 0 are the two components. So set one of them, let's say set z equal to 0. What's left will be a function of the right side of the curve. And conversely, you set the other coordinate to 0, you get something on the left. So things that vanish when you restrict them to the right, you label them by an L. Things that vanish on the left, you label them by R. If something doesn't vanish on either side, you call it central. And effectively, that means that it, it's supported at the node. Two-sided neighborhood of the, of the node. So these numbers here give me the left, center, and right counts of how many parameters we have. So what does that mean? Um, this is, the group is SL4, so the degrees of the invariants are 2, 3, and 4. That's a quadratic differential, a cubic differential, and a quartic differential. So the, f the first number, the first column gives me the numbers of quadratic differentials on the left, the center, and the right. And the second, the second entry gives me the cubics, and the last one gives me the quartics. Sorry, what am I supposed to learn from all this information? Uh, hold on one second. Okay. This is supposed to be the trivial example. I'm going to give you non-trivial exa example, and uh, hopefully that will become clear. Okay. So th this just repeats what I was saying about the, the base. So you define the right and center part to be the stuff that vanishes on the left and vice versa. <coughs> So in this case, you get a part. So the, the picture is, you have a large interval system that lives on the generic curve. If you count it, it has 21 base parameters. 12 of those are going to be Casimir's, meaning that they, they parameterize the parameterize it like it leaves, and then the nine remaining ones are the actual parameters on a, the base of symplectic leaf, and then the curves will have genus nine, so you have an, a symplectic integral system. When you go to the node, the nine is going to break into all these numbers. So roughly speaking, you have a three, three, and three. You have a three-dimensional integral system on the left, so you have a three-parameter family of curves of genus three on the left, another three-dimensional integral system on the right, and in addition, there's three parameters on the, in the center that tell you how to, how to glue the curves on the right and the curve on the left. Okay. So the goal is for each component of the dimension corresponding to the degeneration, we want to have an integrable system with a different gauge group and they all together. Mm -hmm. that, so that's exactly the point. So we're going to learn how to calculate these groups and then the reduced gauge groups that the physicists are baffled by are going to just arise at, in, in terms of calculating what, what happens to these Hitchin systems when you restrict them to the same curve. So in, in that trivial example, what was the group on the node? I mean, uh, Yeah, so in that case, the, the group is SL4. And yeah, so the orbit that I get is O4. And the group is SL4. So it's. That's the standard node. It's the most generic picture. The orbit is regular, and the group H is the full group that you started with. There's no, not, there's no reduction. Okay. So, um, 
If you do instead something like 3, 1, and 2, 1 squared, then 4, and 4. So I keep one side as before with the, re with the regular and the potent, but I put some restrictions on the partition type on, on the other curve, on the other component. Then you go through the calculations, you get something like 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 2. 0, 1, 2 is what you get when you have the two regular and the potent. So that's the same as what I had over there. This is the right, this is the left, this is the center. The fact that you have a bunch of zeros here, that, that's a telltale of an ugly theory. So in the ugly theories, you'll always have, well, you'll usually have no Hitchens system at all on one side or the other. Um, so in this case, the node is still over four, but this time you, you, found that, you find that the group H is smaller. So the group, instead of being SU4, is reduced to SU3. Sorry, sometimes I call it SU and sometimes I call it SL. There's no logical dis distinction between them. Then you can do very s similar examples, and in, each <coughs> and in each of them you can figure out what, what's the node and, wh and what's the group in the node and what's the important at the moment. Maybe the most entertaining elementary example, so I'll skip a few. This is my fifth example, I'm going to refer to it as such. So you do 2, 1 squared, 2, 1 squared, 4, and 4. So in this case, this <coughs> this is the first case where the millipotent of the node cannot be regular. So in this case, it turns out to be the type three one. In the group H is the two. Actually. Let me mention one last example. Let's go up to the next size group, SO5. So I'll do 3, 1 squared, and 3, 1 squared, and 5, and 5. And <coughs> so now you have a system like that, which has a certain number of center parameters, if you turn them off so that you get an input and at the node, you get a system on the right, which is six-dimensional, and it's a Hitchin system on a single P1 with three nodes, one, two, and the actual node, and a regular input in each of them. So that's boring. But on the left, you get a system that's one-dimensional, so it's called the E6 Minahan Nemeshansky integral system. So it's a small system, but it cannot be realized. So there is no conjugacy class in SL5, such as this system is, what you get on P1, from Hitchin on P1 with these two nodes in, in any third one. So it's, from this point of view, it's, it's completely mysterious. And it has secret E6 symmetry. In fact, if you move from the, if you, if you use mirror symmetry to go to the Higgs branch, the Higgs branch ends up being the smallest nilpotent orbit of the group E6, the exceptional group. So, so E6, the, the Liage where E6 is actually, actually by conjugation. Okay. Let me. While I'm uh, off my side, let me mention one other feature that is 
worth mentioning, which is the final structure. So we have the moduli space, or the delin market compactification of the moduli space, over each point we have a Hitchin system, consisting of a base and some fibrillation over it. So the Hitchin <coughs> bases form a vector bundle over MGN bar. Is it? <coughs> so the only invariant that's, that people have looked at is the rank of it. Well, it's a vector bundle. In fact, it's direct sum over, R, over I going from 1 to the rank of the group of subbundle BI, where BI is the section of the I tuple power or whatever. But Turns out that there's a lot of, of finer information than just this obvious decomposition. <laughs> and that comes from the global geometry of the moduli space. So for example, take G to be 0, N to be 4. So M bar is CP1. We know that every vector bundle on P1 decomposes in the direct sum of line bundles of certain degrees. So you have these hitherto unseen invariants the degrees of the pieces in the base. So let me just write them down for you. So for example, um, so B I is going to have dimension 2I plus 1 because the basic line bundle is, is all of 2. The i power is, is all of 2n. It's not 2i, uh, so it's 2i plus 1. So what is that vector bundle? If i is even, let's say i is 2m, this ends up being four copies of o plus o of 1 up to o of m minus 1, and then one copy of O of m. And if i is odd, we get the same four copies of everything else plus three copies of O of m. So I don't know any conceptual way to see this. I just compute direct images of under the map from p to tilde to p1, and that's the decomposition I get. As far as I know, these are new invariants that have not appeared anywhere else. And the physicists are trying to figure out what, what they need for physics. How much of the time? 22 minutes. 22 or 22 minutes ago? Thank you. OK. <laughs> so this is a picture of example 5, I believe. So I've already explained that. So let's get that. OK. So let me talk about some of the techniques that go into the, into the analysis. So one part of it has to do with, new, with the local story. So forget the node. Just work on the smooth curve and ask, what's the relation between the input and orbit and the singularity of the spectral cover? So um, an input and orbit is, put, is specified by its Hitchin partition of the dual non partition. The spiral curve has some equation with AI or fluid differentials, section of KC to the I with a large pole of some order, or alternatively vanishing to some order, so the order of zeros plus the order of poles adds up to I. For a given input and orbit OK, instead of the, the kth point, zero order is the row number containing i in the num, in the num diagram of OK. So let me just just read that. So if I want to do the regular orbit, 
So the non-diagram looks like this. If I just label things, I get one, two, three, four. All of them are in the first row. So that tells you that all the chi's are one. So that w that's how I got that all the chi's were one for the regular orbit. In the subregular, I'll have one, two, three, and four. So three of the, of the chi i's will be one, and the fourth will be two. So that means the quadratic and cubic differentials will vanish to first order, and the quartic differential will vanish quadratically. And similarly here, the diagram, the num diagram will be this. So one, two, three, four. That says that the quadratic differential has to vanish to first order, the cubic and the quartic vanish quadratically, and so on. What, what is the number? I'm sorry? What is the number? The Hitchin diagram. Or the Hitchin partition. <coughs> I just is, I just take the Jordan box it's and make a partition. Your algebra with this special number. It's just a transpose. So why it's called number? Because for other groups, it, it actually it, it actually has something to do with nouns equations. I'm not, I'm not not sure I can hmm. reconstruct it, but it somehow is related to, to nouns equations and those. Neither noun nor H determine the other in general. You, you need to specify both of them. So, uh, 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 like I said, it's something called spot and strength volatility between, between orbits. All right. So, uh, yeah, so if you do a quick calculation like this, and you see that the regular is put in orbit. And the single row so it gives all the vanishing one for an i, the subway gives a bunch of ones and two, and so on. The orbit over the terms of the generic form of the spell curve, not the actual form. So if you fix the orbit, that tells you what to expect for the spell cover, but you could have accidental further singularities. Or conversely, a given spell cover determines the smallest orbit over. The actual orbit obtained from it may be any, anything containing it in its closure. So, for example, the regular and the potent corresponds to line bonds on C tilde. The smallest orbit corresponds to the direct image of line bonds on the normalization of C tilde. So, there's a, a lemma somewhere that maybe due to Lamont that says that the Higgs field is regular if and only if the speckled sheaf is a line bundle. Generically, it would be a line bundle on a smooth curve, but it can also be a line bundle on a singular curve. But if it's not a line bundle, if it's a torsion-free sheaf, necessarily on a singular curve, that will correspond to an irregular orbit. Okay. Coefficient AI is a section of the line, of a line bundle, which you can write either in terms of the chi i's or the pi i's, and do some combinations. You get uh, the space of all sections is vector space of some dimension bi. The space of all such sections, yeah. So this is the formula in, in complete generality. This is when the, this was when the genus was zero, which is the case we're interested in. So I mentioned the good, bad, and ugly. You said that the system is good if the, if the quality holds, which roughly corresponds to uh, no no high cohomology. Co for the line bundles. Let's skip, skip the, the middle of the statement. <coughs> so you can also write down an explicit algorithm for describing the singularities of spark covers in terms of the resolution process. So the, the steps in the resolution are encoded in the, in the Hitchin or NAM diagrams that control it. For that, I don't know how to do this in five minutes. So what we really want to do is consider Hitchin systems on singular curves and the generation from a smooth curve to a singular curve. So allow the curve C to be in the Goldstein. We don't really need it, just uh, a stable curve with, with nodes. So uh, any curve with nodes will, will do. 
as in the smooth case, the Hitchin system for s the curve C reductive with G is a space of Higgs bundles. In case you have the Higgs field, a G Higgs bundle is a pair of V phi, and so on. So all of this goes through pretty obviously. And again, you have a JT quotient or a static quotient. And you form the, ba the Hitchin base. The question is, is this a flat degeneration or is something jumping? So uh, just a little list of the result. The, the Higgs moduli space, or the singular one, go inside curve, is going to be Poisson, as in Markman's results. It's a plot leaves are obtained by restricting the residues at each mark point to a quarter of orbit. And the H map is weakly Lagrangian. So all of these are straightforward analogs of Markman's theorem in the smooth case. The, the weakness here is that I'm talking about actual Higgs bundles, plus Higgs sheets. That means that the moduli space, the fibers of the moduli space are not going to be compact. So the system, while it has all the formal properties of the smooth case, it, it's not a proper system anymore. So you really want to figure out how to properize it, how to partially compactify it so it becomes proper, <coughs> hopefully while remaining Poisson and keeping the, the leaves selecting and so on. So as far as I know, that's not been done. There is a certain amount of work by these people on constructive compactification, but they haven't checked whether it's whether compactification is Poisson. So uh, just the, the, the flavor of the result, we have results on the splitting of the base into left, center, and right pieces, which I tried to explain. We have some results about what happens as you go to the normal limit in particular. Is it a flat limit? We have results about singularities with straw covers, some stuff about non compatibility of the fibers, and global structure of the bundle of fusion base. That's what I was explaining over there. So if you consider just a one parameter degeneration of family of curves CT degenerated to a singular curve C0, and the case of immediate interest is where we have a rational curve splitting into a left component and a right component, intersecting into node P. So one thing you can show is that the sufficient condition for flatness is that the basic line bundle, K C0 or D, or the singular curve is very ample on the limiting base curve. Then you can show that the Poisson and Hitchin system in, in the setting of the, would, fall a flat would be a flat limit of the Hitchin systems for the varying curves. Particularly the same holds for each of the symplectic leaves. So, so if the family of curves is the pencil of conics, our standard example, the condition simply says that there are at least two points on each component, therefore exactly two points on each component. So if two, co two points go to each component, you're fine. If one goes to one and three go to the other, then it, it's not going to be a flat point. So the interesting feature then is that for our degenerating agent systems, we see that the restriction to one component of the limit can be a proper subspace of the sections, let's say, on the right side. So this will happen on the right side when the line bundle on the left side has higher co-merge. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you the calculation in a second. In other words, when the degree dij is less than equal to minus two, it's a, just a line bundle on P1. So um, to make a long story short, you do some calculation. You see that you have numbers bi left, bi right, and bi center, let's say this prime, <coughs> and you calculate them, and they turn out to be things like the maximum of the degree of the left and zero, and so on. The prime indicates that this is the dimension that you get from the limit. On the other hand, the question is whether these dimensions equal their unprimed counterparts, which is what you get. And one of them arises in the limit as t goes to zero, and the other one lives just on the, on the limit curve. And 
generalize a little bit, you, you, you look at some uh, the restriction sequence. The line of the singular curve goes in the line on the right. The kernel is the line on the right shifted by one to the branches of the node. So you just work out the long exact sequence and you get your line. So back to this example number five, which is the one in there. So the order of poles is going to be one for the quadratic cubic and quarter differentials on the left, and one to three on the right. That was the number that I had. Yeah, somewhere. So you do some calculations in smooth curves, you do some calculations in the empty curves, and you get that the degree on the left is minus two. So now the curves are the minus two. That tells you that this, this degeneration is going to be non-flat. That's essentially what leads to the group that you get in this case being SU3 as opposed to SU4. So this is the, this explains the, the, re, the reduction in the, 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 the gauge group. Is there kind of a, a, a more systematic way of saying that? Like some invariant of, of non-flatness that you can read off that tells you why it's, it's I think it's sufficient but not necessary, but the condition is just that the degree of the line bound, so that's going to be, for the i line bound, it would be 2 times i, let's say in the case that I'm dealing with, it would be 2 times i minus chi i. And the chi i is specified by the type of the deployment that you're imposing. So if that number is minus 2 or less, that's when you're, you're going to get a reduction. Do you have a general formula for what the reduction is? Like if you started with gauge group SLN, then? Yes. So uh, we do it under uh, some, some physics constraints. But the last section of the paper gives a complete classification of all the groups that you get. And it's actually a surprisingly small list. So when the, low, when the, gauge, when the upper area gauge group is SUN, the only groups you can get are SUM for something less than N, or an, an orthogonal, or a symplectic, or E6, E7, and E8. And those are the only separate that you get. So it's an A, B, C, D, E classification. Anyway, uh, let me just uh, conclude. So a key puzzle for the physicist is that the Coulomb branches of the S-class theory is decomposed as hypercalar quotient of products of Coulomb branches of many components. The group you need to divide by is often the full group, but sometimes the proper subgroup. That's the issue that I keep getting back to. So we give an algorithm for determining which is the case and what the weekly cover gauge, gauge subgroup is. That's our realization due to BFN, so that's uh, Nakajima, Finkelberg, and Braverman, going backwards, uh, which, counter to the notation of my physicist friends, tells you that you can also get it as a hypercalar quotient by the full group. So you can get the same Higgs space, the, the same Higgs branch as a hypercalar quotient in two different ways. One is you follow the recipe here, dividing by H. And they have a different recipe where they start with a larger hypercalar thing and divide it by the full J. And at the moment, it's very mysterious why the two portions are the same. So you might. They don't think of it in terms of number of curves, but they end up getting the, si the same order. So the, po the point is that the number curve is just a crutch. The Modular of the theory is the same at all points. So you can calculate it at any boundary point. It, it, it's, it's like the W, like the. It's not just points. It's not just geometry. Linear rows in the structure from the way it generates the superconductor. I mean, we, we've been talking with Nakajima about it, and 
he, he knows how to construct one way to construct the other way. Neither group knows how, knows how to reconcile the, the two constructions. And, uh, it looks like they're both correct. But they're just two different hypercalic quotients which do the same object in the other. Anyway, um, there's some recent progress on his bundles and other curves, and I mentioned some of these papers. For our purposes, it's important to understand not just the modulized spaces, but they do both system structure and that. And that, as far as we know, that this has not been done in that direction which the results could be applied is in the study of the character variety. This is related to the model space of Higgs bundles through the model being called correspondence. Unlike the geometry of Higgs bundle, the geometry of the character variety is completely independent of the choice of complex structure. Particularly, this means that you could choose to work with any complex structure of the curve and use the non abelian hot correspondence to obtain the character variety. So, another possible application is to the study of natural and taboo correlates of the character variety and the behavior of the different choices of pants composition. So, the, the key word there seems to be higher tension and some coordinates. Um, we assume that it's something that might happen someday. We have not really made any problems with it yet. So, um, thank you very much.